Hello, everybody, and welcome to the August meeting of the Howard Astronomical League, HAL. I want to let all these, everybody know that the meeting is being recorded. And um, at the uh, conclusion of the meeting, uh, either later tonight or first thing tomorrow, I will um, uh, give uh, Ken uh, our, um, the, the recording link, and um, then he will post, post it on the website and you can play it back again or portions of it at your leisure. So I'm really happy to have everybody here today. And uh, let's get started with the meeting. So I've changed up the format a little bit um, and have some new features put in here. And I'll talk to you a little bit about them as we get to them. But we always like to start out with our astro humor. So I'll give everybody a second to take that in. There you go. I'm watching Victor laugh, so we know, we know we're good here. <laughs> and I appreciate it when uh, some of you have sent me some of these astro humor stuff. So I do use them when you put them in there because uh, after doing this now, this is my third year putting these meetings together, and it's getting harder and harder to find new material um, that's that's uh, worthy to put on to a family oriented show here. So, so I want to. Uh, um, welcome our, our, all of you, but also, as we do every month, uh, welcome any new members and guests. So first, do we have any uh, new members? Uh, if, you, if there's any new members, uh, first time uh, callers uh, on the, uh, on the uh, meeting tonight, uh, please unmute yourself and introduce yourself. Hey, Mark. Hi, I'm Mark Parsons. I joined, uh, I think, about three weeks ago. Ah, welcome. And what do you do, Mark? Um, I... Cyber Threat Intelligence Analyst for Microsoft. Oh, well, great. Well, welcome. Who else, any other new members? Uh, I'm a new member as of last month. So this is my, this is my second, uh, uh, second meeting I'm attending, but um, I don't think I was a, a member technically until the end of the, uh, the last presentation, so. Well, welcome uh, to being a member technically. And, uh, and where are you from, John? And what do you do? Oh, oh that was uh, Nick, sorry. Oh, Nick. Yeah. Oh, Nick. I saw, I saw John's uh, light up there. Sorry, Nick, I know what you do. Nick's gonna be our guest speaker today. So he'll give you a little bit more uh, background then. So uh, welcome, Nick. I'm looking at John's yellow frame up there. So uh, um, any uh, any uh, guests? I'm a guest. John, John Perry. Oh, there's John. There's John. See, Nick? There's John. But I'm a uh, neighbor of uh, David Illig and uh, Nick Dutton both. Ah. He lives right in between the two of us. And uh, I've uh, worked on and helped David with the uh, his observatory there, the UFO. <laughs> well, it's good to have a tax deduction that lives next to you. So, uh, it is. Yeah. <laughs> well, welcome. Walter to and I are new, new members. Hi. Go ahead and introduce yourselves. So um, my name is Sunny Beatham Hernandez and my husband's Walter Hernandez. Uh, we worked at Naval Research Lab together years ago. Um, he, graduated, he was in grad school at uh, University of Maryland in physics. And um, I've had miscellaneous jobs uh, in, computer, in computer science, working for boroughs and teaching computers in a school. So oh. anyway, and we both enjoyed our, the, one of the star parties meeting oh. uh, several of the members. So. Oh, yeah, great. I do remember you meeting you. Uh, <laughs> we, we went to one where you could actually, we saw the moon and everything. We had people showing us the different craters of the moon. It was really right. nice. Yeah, that was, the, uh, that was the one star party we've had this season where we actually had a few minutes where we could look at something. So yeah, so great. Thanks for joining. Any other guests? I'm Joseph Butler. I'm a guest and a neighbor of Nick. Okay. Oh, Nick, you got his whole fan club there. <laughs> hey, welcome, Joseph. Nice to see you, Joe. <laughs> Any other visitors? All right. Well, we're going to get uh, moving on here to the next step. Uh, once again, welcome. So I want to let everybody know that what's happening right now, literally right now, please don't jump off. Uh, you can catch up uh, later on. Uh, the, um, the Astronomical League, the national, they have their national conference going on today, tomorrow, and Saturday. Uh, it ends tonight at about 11 o'clock. Uh, you can watch it on YouTube. Uh, you, can, you can register through our website. It's actually in the front page of, 
the HAL website. You can get the registration link, the information over there um, and pop right in. I was watching it earlier today. They had some interesting talks going on and I've got a lot of interesting things happening and a lot of door prizes. I didn't win anything yet today um, that I'm aware of. But uh, so this is going on uh, right now. So, and then uh, Don Nab, who you, you've seen, for those of you who get the HAL emails, which are most of you, um, he's the, um, he's the um, chairperson of uh, Merrill, which is uh, the, the uh, Mideast uh, uh, region uh, astronomical league, which we're part of. And uh, he won an award today um, for all his work he's done on the website for them. So it was really a good thing. And he provides us an awful lot of information. So it was well-deserved. So this is going on right now. Um, any of our, um, anybody have any uh, reports from our officers? And you know, for those of you, you know, you see me a lot, you see emails from me, but these are all the people that are behind the scene that really uh, make uh, the club work so well and get, all, get keep it all running and get information to me so I get it on to you or get it on to you directly. So um, a big hand, you know, applause for, for, all, for all of those people that who, uh, who make the club run so well. Anybody uh, on the officers have anything to report? This is Ron. I'll just make a comment that um, it's not really a report, but I can say that all of the officers are, are really active. There's lots of good things going on and behind the scenes, there's tons of activity. Right. And by the way, you know, it's, it's, it's early in the summer yet, but our officers uh, have one year terms, which some of them stay on for a couple more years. Uh, and, but if you're anybody's interested in becoming an officer or a committee chairperson uh, for HAL, you know, just drop me an email and I'll make sure that, uh, you know, we, we talk to you and we can answer any questions you get involved. Uh, everybody's invited to the planning meetings. Uh, if you want to send in a real kind of HAL business meeting, which is the first Monday of every month. Um, so that's going on. I do want to take a second here to talk about these meetings and going back to Robinson Nature Center uh, for in-person meetings. So he, I'm going to give this to you right now. We could have a conversation at the end of the night um, because I don't want to take up all the time right now, but you know, think about this. So what I'm thinking about doing, and I've been talking to other members of our leadership team, is continuing with these monthly meetings on Zoom only. It's going to be quite complicated, um, and there's a lot of room for technical failure in trying to run a hybrid meeting um, with multiple cameras and everything from the Robinson Nature Center. And, and having so many of you join that may have a hard time driving in or you know, for whatever reason. And then so, but not, not, not wanting to completely eliminate the in-person experience when it's comfortable for everybody to get back together to continue to use the Robinson Nature Center for a monthly event that won't be done on Zoom, but you know, we'll get, you know, whether it's an Astro School type thing or um, some other kind of event where we get together on a different Thursday during or a different day during the month. And it'll be a fixed day so everybody will know that it'll happen. So give that some thought. I don't want any uh, um, feedback right now. You could uh, put some comments in the chat if you like. Um, and then we'll, we'll pick up. And then at the end of the night, if somebody wants to stay on after everything's over and talk about this a little bit, I'd love to get your input. So with that said, and by the way, once again, if anybody's looking to, you know, to, you're looking for a telescope, accessories, some other device, or you have something you want to sell, go ahead and drop it in the chat in the, to everyone. But whoever, if somebody's going to respond back to that person with interest, please respond only to that person. You can pick their name. You can see raise name in the box. Okay, so uh, hey, Phil, uh, I I would like to just uh, tell people that you know if they are interested in becoming an officer, you, uh, being vice president is really easy. You you uh, you just kind of wait for the president to like have something else to do, and then you can come in and step in. But for the most part, it's really easy. It's not not a lot going on. So. It's a good way to get your feet wet if you uh, if you're interested in uh, getting more active in the club. There you go. There's and Victor practicing thing, so he could take over for me when I'm when I'm done being president. <laughs> yeah. And another thing is that um, the weather and the smoke and whatnot really hasn't been cooperating, but 
I, I do intend on calling another remote impromptu when, uh, you know, when the weather cooperates, maybe at the next dark of the moon, which would be a, a star party, not necessarily right at the observatory, but maybe at a at another location that might be a little bit farther or more remote. So stamp, I'll make an announcement on the if, if I'm able to do that. Great. Thank you very much. And um, I sent out an email earlier today, I believe it was, uh, maybe it was yesterday, um, talking about uh, the, those of you who are our chief telescope operators and uh, our certified telescope operators and certified telescope assistants looking to be trained on the new focuser and the new software. Um, uh, we're working on a plan for that because we definitely all want to get um, the observatory halo opened again and open for safe utilization. And, and um, so stay in touch, uh, watch the emails. Hopefully this will happen sooner than later. Anything else from anybody on the officers or committee chair? All righty. So here's a new feature because of the, all the cloud situation and I call it uh, Hail, Maryland, <laughs> Hail Maryland special feature for August 2021, above and below the clouds. So this is what was happening because we certainly couldn't see it ourselves. But uh, and ironically enough, I found this on AccuWeather or my wife found it and uh, sent me a link and it's called Above the Clouds. Um, but uh, and so tonight is the uh, opposition of Jupiter. So tonight Jupiter, believe it or not, is, is at its brightest uh, point for, for this year. And um, uh, maybe you will, some of you will get a peek at it tonight um later on after the meeting uh, maybe you'll get a break in the clouds and you'll be able to see it so it's it's, it's it's big and it's close and bright the other thing that uh you know which is really a shame is the percy meteor shower um i know um jim is lane uh who's going to talk to us in just a minute here for a couple minutes um uh did some work with the perseids but uh I, I, did anybody actually get to see them uh, this week, Joel's raising his hand. Hannah's shaking her head. So I got to see them. It was I got a really nice view from the mountains, and it was cleared up each night for several hours. It wasn't really dark skies, but we had thunderstorms in the afternoon, and then some clear skies at night. I counted over twenty each night. I think. Wow, where was that, Steve? Um, Lost River, near Lost River State Park, West Virginia. Oh, I never heard of that one. That's a new one. I mean, it's, near, it's near Mountain Meadows, if you've heard oh, of that area. Lower Mountain Meadows. Is. In Maine, we seen, I wasn't there on the 12th, but we, I was there from the 1st to the 9th, and we had an, a, a little peak um, on uh, August 2nd that we, over a period of about three or four hours, we probably saw 30 to 40. And then I saw something online that there was another, what they were calling a filament. On the 14th, there was a burst as well right yeah that was saturday morning i missed that i think it was rainy here then thanks joel thanks steve so in the bottom left hand corner you'll see a picture from our our last public star party um you can see the you know halo there and uh thank uh Werner, uh Leonard for uh hope i pronounced your name correctly uh for um for the picture but you got the clouds and everything else so we did, Joel, I think we had, what, about a total of 30 people show up? I'd say 30 to 40. I, by the amount of, uh, I gave single family tours through, and I, I would have guessed 30 to 40 overall. Right. Very good. So, you know, people stayed around, and this time, you know, we had quite a lightning show as we were packing up to leave. Uh, it was literally all around us, so it was probably time to get out of there when we did. But uh, during the week before, we had the uh, plan. Uh, members only star party and um, and we had quite a few people out there and we stayed out there until 11 30 just sitting in chairs like that talking everybody had a really nice time we just didn't get to do any observing again and then this uh, coming Sunday is um, Herman Hain you, for those of you who don't know Herman is a famous uh, person in this area the Baltimore street astronomer who passed away uh, recently and there's a memorial service for him uh, and and very kind of happy celebration of his life event at Oregon Ridge Park uh, in Baltimore and uh, Jim Johnson and myself will be representing Hale 
at the uh, at the event this weekend, and um, we will that telescope that you see behind Herman. Uh, we, um, Hal is now the owner owner of this telescope, which you'll see on display in the observatory at some point in the near future. And we will have this telescope uh, out there with us. Uh, if it's clear, we'll be able to use a solar filter on it during the day. And if it's not, people just get to enjoy seeing the telescope. So that's what's going on. And that's what will happen in August. We'll cover um, what's going on. And then after uh, Nick's talk, which will be coming up shortly, but uh, continuing on though a little bit, uh, Jim, are you on? Jim Lane? Yep, right here. There you go, Jim. Um, Jim does some very interesting work. And Jim, if you just want to take a couple of minutes and uh, talk about these two slides you, um, you did with the uh, Perseids. Sure. Um, so for the folks that have been on before, um, I've talked about uh, meteor, meteor reflections of radio signals. And it, it's a very common thing if, if the lower TV broadcast stations like channel six down, six, five, four, three, and channels two, they're at fit, uh, 50, 60, 70 megahertz and stuff like that. So it, even though it was cloudy, unfortunately here, um, you could still appreciate or enjoy the meteors when they come through. So what's on the screen here, the top and bottom, it's the same picture. I just marked up the bottom picture. So the, the lines that are running across this, uh, this, the trace there, the signals there, there's three solid lines running left to right. Those are TV broadcast signals that are not in our region. They're very far away. I'm still narrowing down on exactly where they're coming from, but um, it's an artifact in the digital signal. And it's a very powerful spike and they create lines. This is audio traces of a TV signal uh, top to bottom is about 150 hertz worth of signal. So very narrow signal picture. And, or actually it's 100, no, it's 120 on this one, sorry. Hey, it's Jim, 120 hertz, yep. Jim, hey, is that television signal, is that a more recent occurrence that you had not seen before three months ago? Uh, not these, no. Then I'll take it offline with you. Okay, go okay, ahead. Yeah, yeah, okay. The other, the next picture is something I tried just to give you know give a shot but this one the these 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 lines are pretty much always there and they're just i'm receiving them over the ground like terrestrially so they're coming in most of them are up in the new england area so i'm receiving them over that they just propagate over the earth but when the meteors come by and in between us you know our area and the broadcast station they reflect the tv signal so if you can see that trace that line in the middle that box there in the, that I have um, on the bottom part, the bottom uh, picture, that trace is a meteor. So when it burns through, um, um, I covered up, I, I should have put the text on the left side. I'm covered up my own, uh, my own words there. Let me minimize you, Phil. Okay, there we go. Three minutes and 30 seconds ionization. So what happens when the meteors come through the atmosphere, the part that we see with our eyes is very quick. You, you know, relatively, you know, you might see a nice long trail and then it's over. What happens in up in about 50, 55 miles up in space is ionization of particles. They stay ionized for, you know, they can be up to upwards of usually a minute for good meteor showers. The Perseids was some very large <laughs> rocks or quote unquote rocks coming through and made ionization times upwards of three and a half to four minutes long, which is very long time. So that means they're reflecting radio signals for upwards of three and four minutes. And this one, I was like blown away, like how long this one was. So this was on the peak. This is the 12th and the 13th of this month that the, the peak was. I missed the 14th. I didn't have the equipment running. I wish I would have got that filament you guys mentioned earlier. But um, so yeah, this is, this is, uh, Again, I wish I knew. I'm still narrowing down on where that middle station's coming from, that center line. Yeah. But, uh, hey, Jim, question yeah. before you change the slide. Sure. That middle trace, what are the little upward peaks on the <laughs> left-hand side, and why are they downward after the uh, meteor goes through? Do you know? That, that's a good question. That I don't know, but that's a good observation, Wayne. I never realized that one. The, little, the middle trace, it looks like little waves. It's their there's there it's it's a artifact of the modulation 
it's actually going up and down. If you can watch it on the screen, it'll just pulse. It's, it's like a, it's not a power cycling. It's just the way the modulation scheme runs on that particular station. It just kind of jiggles up and down where the other ones are, are solid all the time. It's actually a sync. It's a sync signal huh, for okay. uh, people with the box. Remember in 2009, we had to have boxes and you get a coupon yeah. and you put a little box on your TV. Yeah. That signal is for those boxes to lock onto. And it's a very powerful signal. So it makes it makes doing this easier. <laughs> but yeah, that's a good observation. I don't know why it went downwards. That's uh, I'm going to look at my other traces and see if it's doing that. Could it, then, be a, could it be a phase shift because it's being reflected by the that ionization is, trail? That's possible. I, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to look after this and that's a good observation. I don't know. I, okay, I never, thanks. Yeah, that's a good one. And then Wayne, as you pointed out on a previous one, all those squiggly lines, all the, all the curvy lines, those are aircraft. That's reflections off of airplanes. That just, that's all, all the time. That's my light, that's my light pollution. Uh, for radio is all the airplanes around here. Um, the second picture is something I tried recently and got it to work. I'm going to keep pursuing this one. This is the first time I did this. There's a meteor radar in Canada that's outside of uh, London, Ontario, up in Ontario province in Canada. It puts out three different frequencies and I picked up the 29 megahertz frequency so this is, they, they use it for scientific purposes. There, it's one of the few radars around the world that's studying meteors. And so that this one, I do know where the transmitter is, which helped us, you know, if you wanted to kind of nerd out with the propagation and where the meteors were and how high they were and stuff like that. So this is me catching the transmitter in Canada here in, in uh, Anne Arundel County on a vertical antenna. And this, this one's right about at four minutes of burn time. So you can see a little bit of little bit of missing part there towards the tail end. So the left side of this, the left side of the trace, that white line, that's the head of the meteor. And then the ionization stays active for upwards of four minutes and then it dies out. I've got other traces all throughout the 12th and 13th at the peak times. Um, but this was probably the biggest burn was about four minutes. Um, that's really cool. That's really yeah, cool. This one, I'm gonna keep, I'm gonna keep pursuing this one and see how much I can pick off of that radar. So it's pretty neat. So thanks, so. Yeah, thank you, Jim. Hey, I wanna, there's some special recognitions I wanna call out. You know, we have a very talented, um, very talented number of people here in our, in our membership and our friends. And uh, there's a couple of things I wanna, that happened recently, I wanna make some special recognition for. First, uh, Richard, are you on? Richard Orr? No, he's not on, so, what? so Richard, um, this uh, astronomy magazine in Germany, this is not related to the astronomy magazine uh, that we have here in the United States, but um, this picture that you see in the right side, um, this sketch of Richard did here um, of NGC 225 was uh, highlighted as a, a feature topic in this in astronomy magazine in Germany. And it's a pretty big deal. The article's really nice and um, publication is really nice. Um, my German is limited to just a few words, so I wasn't able to read it, but you could, you could glance through enough of it um, uh, to see that um, it's quite a, quite a nice publication. And it's a pretty big honor for, this, to, 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 for Richard. So um, he can play back the recording and see that we, we, uh, we recognize him. So give, give Richard a big hand there. So. And then I know Hannah's on. So Hannah, unmute yourself. So Hannah, congratulations to Hannah. She received an honorable mention for this picture here. And um, I'm gonna let uh, Hannah tell you a little bit about it. And uh, congratulations, Hannah. Thank you. Hi, for those who don't know me, I'm Hannah. I come with friends. Um, but uh, basically, in search of darker skies, this was before I ever visited a dark sky site or anything. Um, I kind of figured that the closest dark skies to me, and for those who don't know, I live in Baltimore City, uh, were in Hartford County, just below the Maryland Pennsylvania um, border. And I found kind of these, there are a lot of empty church parking lots and just empty shopping mall parking lots there. And I would go in an attempt to kind of see the Milky Way or image the Milky Way. And I got very excited 
when I was able to take a picture of the Milky Way from somewhere in Maryland. Um, and then I kind of realized that, yes, I saw the Milky Way, but you can kind of see the culprits directly of why I could only see part of the Milky Way. And I thought that was a very profound testament to the impact of light pollution um, and just kind of how visually speaking, like from the observer's perspective, the farther the sky protrudes away from the lights, the more of the Milky Way that you can see. Um, and this year was the International Dark Skies, I believe second uh, Capture the Dark contest. And one of their categories was, um, you know, uh, was the impact of light pollution amongst a bunch of other categories. And I kind of saw that they were posting a lot of the winners. And I said, oh, that's cool. I saw, you know, who won for this category. And I didn't think much of it. I thought, oh, that was a great photo. They're very deserving. And so I went to see who else won. And I said, wait, I took that photo. So I kind of stumbled upon it for happenstance. But yeah, um, I'm very excited that um, a lot of people probably from all over the world heard about Pilesville, Maryland for the first time in their lives. And also this is a huge honor and I'm very excited about it. And hopefully, you know, maybe things can change with the impact of light pollution, but there are always steps to take to get started. So thank you, Phil, for this opportunity to speak about my photo. You're welcome. Congratulations, everybody. Give Hannah a big hand. If you want to autograph pictures from Hannah, you can go through me. I'm her president of her fan club. Okay, sure, so, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> and I only take a 40% cut. So, okay. Um, all right, so let's we got coming up. So Nick, are you still with us? Hey, I'm still here. Okay, so Nick has warned uh, me earlier on that um, he has uh, had some computer crashes during the uh, during the day today. So there is a possibility that we may be doing a song and dance while he reboots, uh, if that should happen. But let me uh, uh, thank uh, David uh, Illig for introducing Nick to us. And uh, um, Nick is also not only our guest speaker, but he's a new member and he's come to our event, and uh, it's it's great. And uh, so um, I'll let Nick talk about um, exactly what he's going to talk about tonight. But Nick has, uh, he's, um, at, he's a Johns Hopkins Applied University Applied Physics Laboratory. Um, he, he has degrees in aerospace engineering, astronautical engineering, and physics uh, from 2013 to 2018. Nick was the chief engineer and co-founder of Clear Aspect Solutions, LLC. And in 2018, Nick left the CAS to join APL in pursuit of a more scientifically oriented work as senior professional staff in the Space Exploration Center. So Nick, we're thrilled to have you here today as our guest presenter, and we're really looking forward to uh, your presentation. If anybody's got questions for Nick, um, Nick, it's up to you if you want to take them uh, while you're going on, or if you want to wait to the end, you can pop them in the chat, whatever you want. It's all yours. I'm going to stop sharing my screen so you can start sharing yours. All right, great. Um... Let me uh, share my screen. Uh, yeah, so feel, everyone feel free to ask questions as you have them. I don't, uh, don't mind that at all. Uh, probably won't be able to answer them. Uh, <laughs> but uh, we'll see. Are you guys seeing yep. my uh, slide of, of myself with my yep. hand awkwardly in my pocket for some reason? I don't understand why I was doing that. It must have been cold. Um, all right, so before I start, um, I thought it'd be a good idea to kind of introduce myself to everyone since uh, I am a new member. Uh, so as the slide says, my name is Nick Dutton. Hopefully I'm not somebody else today. Um, so I joined last month after, after watching the, um, uh, the previous uh, uh, lecture that you guys gave. I was really impressed with all the astrophotography work you guys are doing. Uh, personally, I've kind of had some, uh, some trouble with it myself. I've only taken my scope uh, there out a handful of times. Uh, I keep myself pretty busy with other things, and so this is a, a hobby that I would like to get more into. Um, but uh, yeah, so as, as Phil mentioned, I have an um, undergraduate degree in aerospace engineering and physics uh, from the University of Alabama. There are football fans in the, in, the, uh, in the house. I see some thumbs up. That's awesome. Uh, roll Tide. Yeah, no, gig them um, Aggies. <laughs> okay. Yeah, we'll see you this year, maybe. I don't know. I haven't looked at the schedule yet. Um, but uh, so I did about two and a half years of uh, research undergrad actually in materials testing. So I did um, penetration testing uh, and looking at isotropic materials under high strain rate uh, conditions. So uh, basically just shooting things out of large guns 
measuring the deformation afterwards. That was kind of fun. Um, writing some papers on on different uh, different theories about materials and stuff. So that was cool. Uh, so then I uh, I graduated at the at the end of the uh, or kind of the start really of the uh, the housing recession in uh, 2008 2009 timeframe and nobody was hiring so I decided to move to California and uh, go ahead and get a master's degree and so I studied astronautical engineering at the University of Southern California um, and you know uh, 10 11 years later I'm back in school again because uh, I, I wasn't doing too much technical work there for a while. And so I thought it'd be a good idea to kind of knock some of the cobwebs out of my brain. Um, so my first job was at, at this uh, company called TASC. Uh, it's an acronym that stands for the Analytical Sciences Corporation. Uh, they've now been absorbed multiple times. I think they're SAIC now, uh, if anybody's familiar with them, typical you know, defense contractor. Uh, while I was there, I did uh, a lot of modeling and simulation for orbital mechanics, uh, astrodynamics propagation, uh, and I worked on some infrared systems, uh, imaging systems as well. And so um, I was there for about three and a half years, four years, and then uh, I was approached by some, uh, some retired um, Air Force colonels, a couple of them, and they asked me to uh, help them found the company. So I developed some software that does uh, kind of like high level system trades uh, for different like government acquisition programs, so it gives you know decision makers a lot of a lot of choices to look at, look and say like yes I want to purchase this thing or no I think this one's better, um, kind of kind of decision aided uh, tools. So uh, it's going pretty well. Um, when I left, there was about four of us when we started. We ramped down to two of us at one point. It's a super small company, so being the chief engineer of a two person company, it's a glorified title, right? It doesn't actually mean anything means I'm the one technical guy in the company. That's all that is. So I like to tell people that. And then like, by the way, it's just, it doesn't, it doesn't really mean a whole lot. So it's kind of a, kind of a joke, but um, so I was doing that for a while, kind of growing the company, uh, getting some pretty good momentum going, but um, I ended up doing mostly business development kind of stuff after that, because I developed the software. Uh, the government actually owned the software at that point, And they just wanted us to kind of do analysis with it. And um, so there wasn't really, a whole lot of technical stuff going on there. Um, uh, weird, weird round of circumstances. Uh, ended up at APL uh, after after being with uh, Clear Aspect Solutions for about four and a half, five years, uh, and been pretty pretty happy since then. So I joined in 2018, and uh, get to work on some really cool stuff now. Um, so one of those projects is MiniRF, which I'm going to talk about today. Uh, another one that I find very, very interesting is um, energetic neutral atom imagers. So it's a, a different type of sensor. A lot of people haven't heard about it. Um, if you're interested after the talk, ask me about it. I'll, I'll kind of give you the background. Um, I do a little bit of image processing on, on the side, some digital signal processing uh, and algorithm development mostly for, for some of my other tasks. So, uh, so the talk today is, is mostly going to be about um, image formation with uh, uh, bi-static radar data. And uh, so I do have a cop out here. I'm not a radar expert. And it sounds like some of the images you guys showed earlier, some of you might be. Um, so if I misspeak, please uh, uh, please step in and, and correct me because I'm, I'm kind of new with the, the whole radar thing. So, um, all right, so quick, quick overview is uh, uh, we're going to go through like a high level, you know, what is radar, what is SAR, uh, give you guys kind of some background on uh, MINI-RF. Uh, we'll talk about the processing chain we use to, you know, take the packet data and actually form images with the with the radar data, and um, talk about some current research that I'm working on. Uh, but we use these science, you know, different types of science products we generate with that, and uh, some of the current research I'm working on, and then. Uh, go to questions after that, or you know, like I said, ask questions as uh, as they come up. Okay, so uh, so what so, is radar? Uh, so what is radar? Oh, does somebody have a question? Yeah, somebody have a question? Oh, there's a there's an echo. Right there. Must have, I must be hearing myself. Okay, somebody has. Um, okay. I miss. Uh, hold on here. Uh, please don't make sure you're you're muted there. I see. Yeah, I think it's our Zoom. I think it's our Zoom. Okay. Oh, I, I don't have a question. Sorry. Okay. Hey, no worries, man. Uh, so what is RADAR? RADAR is an acronym, stands for Radio Detection and Ranging. Um, it's it's kind of interesting, right? It's compared to uh, camera systems because it doesn't depend on lighting conditions. 
uh, because you provide your own illumination with it. Uh, some people call it an all weather sensor. I mean, yes, yes and no, right? Like if, if there's like a big storm or something, you can still get degradation in your signals and uh, you may not be able to penetrate atmosphere kind of stuff. So um, so ra most radars, they're, they typically emit in the uh, microwave region of the electromagnetic spectrum, which is kind of a subset of the radio wavelength spectrum. Um, and we can, uh, the interesting thing about this, and, and you know, I only work on this uh, kind of part time, but I, it is pretty fascinating that you can take radio signals and actually form, uh, form imagery with it. And so I thought, I thought this would be um, a pretty cool talk to show you guys how we do it on mini -RF. Right. Uh, so, so real aperture radar, uh, it's kind of like your, your standard radar, right? Or an altimeter. And so the way these things were typically uh, originally designed was for um, ranging, right? You want to know how far something away uh, is away. For, so like, for example, a point scatter or something. Um, so kind of taking a look at this geometry, uh, some definitions here. You've got uh, your flight path, which you can think of a spacecraft and aircrafts going along uh, this line here. Uh, in the same direction, uh, always in that same direction parallel is your azimuth. And um, perpendicular to that is the, is the range. So at every point in time, you kind of have this um, cylindrical coordinate system that you kind of, it's useful to help, help reference and think about. Hey, hey Nick, um, is this going to be on the test at the end of your presentation? <laughs> Um, no, no, there's no test. And I, so I apologize for the equations. I'm going to really gloss over these. Um, the, the key, the key thing to remember here is that, uh, the, these original radars, right. To do ranging, they have very poor azimuth re resolution. Okay. And so your resolution is really limited to the, uh, the beam width on the ground, which you see here is a function of the altitude or the height. Um, and so the next slide, I'm going to talk to you about SAR, how, how, it, uh, how, how it mitigates that. But um, so, yeah, so to give you an example, so you have like an 800 kilometer uh, uh, spacecraft, right? In order to get one meter resolution on the ground azimuth, you'd need about a 30 kilometer antenna size, which is, is enormous, right? You, you can't put that up in space. Well, you could, I guess, but it's cost prohibitive. So um, there's a, a guy in the 1950s uh, named Carl Wiley who came up with an uh, interesting approach. Uh, it was called um, Doppler beam sharpening at the time. Uh, now it's called SAR, synthetic aperture radar. The big idea behind this is that whoop, uh, the big idea behind this is that uh, you take advantage of the uh, uh, the moving spacecraft or aircraft, and then you post-process that data out. Right, so you can um, theoretically prove uh, mathematically proved that uh, going through this, that uh, actually when you when you do SAR and you do some post processing, that your azimuth resolution, uh, so again in this kind of uh, cylindrical coordinate system direction, is uh, is actually about half the size of your antenna dimension in that direction. The cool thing is that it's not uh, a function of how far away you are, right? Which is pretty pretty mind boggling if you think about it, right? Um, the resolution of your imaging system isn't a function of, of how far away you are in that dimension, which is kind of crazy. So um, if you think about uh, these two point scatterers, right, and that's kind of that kind of goes back to the definition of your resolution. So your resolution is defined by um, how well you can distinguish point scatterers. So if you have two objects in a certain, you know, uh, range cell that you're looking at, at what point that do they become distinguishable from one another? At what point can you see that there's two versus one? So like it's kind of the how one measure of how good your your radar imaging system is. Um, and uh, you can you know basically you're just using Doppler uh, Doppler shifts, um, the same range uh, same range compression here, and you can kind of just look at the timing, and that's how you that's how you get um, uh, good azimuth. All right, so um, quick introduction for MINI-RF. So now we know a little bit about SAR. Uh, MINI-RF was originally a DOD uh, 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 radar, and it's, it's what's called a hybrid dual polarized SAR. And they decided to actually put it on kind of last minute on LRO as a tech demonstration. Uh, so it wasn't like really originally planned in the, in the whole design, from my understanding. 
Uh, it launched in 2009, so it was a good bit before my time. I'm missing a lot of the details, uh, you know, about the about the history and all. But um, so so what hybrid dual polarized means is that essentially the radar transmits uh, in circular polarization. So it's a, a left-handed circular. So you know, if you put your thumb in the, the pointing direction of the EM radiation, rotate with the left-handed sense. That's kind of the time evolved uh, polarization kind of rotates in that direction. Uh, the dual polarized piece of it, um, we basically receive in uh, horizontal and vertical. So you're you're in a linear mode and you receive simultaneously coherent coherent pulses that you're transmitting um, uh, horizontally and vertically uh, at the same time. So uh, it can uh, receive in two different bands. Uh, it used to be able to transmit, I should probably back up. So you have, uh, the transmitter actually failed about a year into the mission. And uh, it's kind of a, bum of a bummer, right? And a lot of uh, some smart scientists figured out that, hey, why don't we just transmit from the earth and replicate that signal from the earth. We'll bounce that EM radiation off the moon, but we'll, re we'll see, uh, leave the receiver open and uh, so they, they tried that out as an experiment and it actually worked and we're still doing that, you know, 10 years later and still collecting good science data. Uh, I don't know if you guys know uh, Arecibo, but it, it collapsed last year. Unfortunately, that was our S-band transmitter on the ground. We currently are unable to do S-band. We do still do X-band. So we've got a couple of different ground stations that transmit X-band for us. Um, the bi-static geometry here kind of give you guys a sense of uh, what's going on. So here's the transmitter at Earth. Uh, there's going to be three distinct signals that show up in the data that we kind of have to have to use and process out. Uh, so the first one's the backscatter, which is the signal that we want. It's diffusely reflected. And um, the second one is the what we call the direct path. And so that's the signal coming directly from Earth without bouncing off of anything, going directly into the back of the receiver. Um, and then the third one is forward scatter, which is kind of the unwanted signal. It's the... Um, uh, specular reflection point, which is kind of where your range uh, resolution blows up to infinity. So it's very, very poor in that region. So we have to process that out too. Okay, so some, uh, some images here of LRO and the high bay. Um, there's some other instruments on LRO. So uh, mini RF is the one here wrapped up. It's, you know, this guy here is basically just kind of canted off the side at about 46 degrees uh, from, the, from the side of the spacecraft. Uh, image here just kind of shows you the relative size compared to a couple guys in the background. Uh, you know, I don't, I don't know too much about the electronics personally, but if you know, you guys are interested in that, if you're listening here, so you can take a look. Uh, some of these other instruments, uh, LROC, that's a kind of the primary, primary instrument on board LRO. It's a, it's a very high resolution camera. It's got a wide angle camera and two narrow angle cameras. Um, some of these other instruments, LOLA is a laser altimeter. So it does uh, precise ranging, uh, helps, helps get, um, uh, build digital elevation models uh, and surface roughness maps for, uh, for the moon. All right, so this one is a, another one of those things that I don't know much about. So I'm not an electrical engineer, but I did throw it in here because I know some people are interested in this kind of stuff. Um, and so, you know, my, my basic kind of crude understanding is um, the stuff that I'm personally interested in comes from here. And so this is where most of the magic happens for me. And uh, so you convert the signals basically down to baseband, you packetize all the information, compress it. Um, and there's a, a NASA standard for, for packets, headers and packet data, metadata kind of stuff called CCSDS. If anyone's interested in that kind of stuff, feel free to, feel free to look it up. Um, but most of, most of NASA's uh, uh, missions they use that they use that uh, data packet format to uh, to transmit um, science information and other stuff and, and other things. Okay. Uh, so our primary um, science and exploration objectives these aren't the you know the the ones that are you know on paper and or in the requirements documents from the get go. These are kind of my and some other teams. Uh, team members interpretations of really what we should be doing. So um, the primary one is we're looking for water ice on the moon with MINI-RF. Uh, MINI-RF is kind of in a, a unique position because we're the only instrument aboard LRO that can actually penetrate the surface. Uh, we go down to uh, a 
little less than a meter uh, at most, depending on the wavelength uh, that we're using. So uh, another one is to characterize the surface roughness. So we're looking, we're trying to help the Artemis mission. Uh, if you guys know about the Artemis mission, it's the uh, NASA planned 2024 mission to put uh, women on the moon uh, by, by 2024. And so we're kind of helping uh, map out some different regions where we think might be, might be a good place to land. Um, you know, doing, uh, basically improving the overall like full picture of the lunar surface uh, from a geography or I guess selenography uh, perspective is the, is the correct terminology. Uh, and then we also uh, have another unique capability to where we can um, observe the ejecta from, from craters uh, better than any of the other any of the other instruments on board LRO. Uh, so you might see some of that in some of these pictures. So if I, I apologize if I'm putting you guys to sleep. There are some cool images coming up uh, in, in a few more slides. So just just bear with me. All right. Um, so this is kind of a, a quick overview of the. You know, it looks like you have a question. Oh, cool. Hey, uh, Arjun. Arjun? Yeah, I have a question. So yeah. how exactly yeah. do you measure surface roughness based on the radiation which is hitting the moon? Like how exactly do you measure the surface roughness? Yeah, so um, so the LOLA instrument is uh, a little bit better equipped to do that than uh, the MINIRF radar. MINIRF can do it, but it's not really one of our primary uh, science objectives. So so LOLA, it's a, it's a laser altimeter, okay? And they, uh, I'm, I'm, I don't know much about it because I don't work on it, but I've read some papers on it, so I'll just kind of talk to it. Um, but but what Lola does is it sends a pulse down, and, and it receives the pulse again after the spacecraft moves a little bit. Okay, and so it it has a, a reference ellipsoid um, in which it's expecting get, to get something back, and then when it receives that signal again, it looks at the time difference and what it expected versus what it received. And so in order to do that, you also need pretty good precision on where you think your spacecraft is too. And so it becomes kind of a, uh, um, what's it called, a, uh, uh, a least squares problem, right? To kind of minimize all your errors and, and make an estimate for uh, what, the, what, the surface, what the surface height is. And so they, they do this kind of like in a, a triangular shape and they'll measure here, here, here. And I think the distance between them is probably like 20-ish meters between them. And I think they can get down to um, uh, just, just under meter scale. So probably, I don't know, uh, 10, okay, 10, ten, ten, ten several, several tens of, of uh, centimeters. Okay, thanks. Yeah, yeah, and you can do it with the radar too. You need, um, you need multiple spectrums also. So you need like to cross S and X band. And, and look at the, the radar shading in order to do that. But. OK, thanks. Yep. Uh, OK, so kind of the first steps, we get the, we get the packet data on the ground. Uh, there's some calibrations that we have to apply to that. Uh, don't want to go into too much detail because, I mean, people are probably you know, writing entire books on this kind of stuff. But you have to account for the temperature of the receiver. Uh, gains and phase and balances because the horizontal and vertical channel they're off they're kind of off a little bit and so we kind of pre-calibrated the instrument uh, and we apply those after the after the um, science packet data comes down for every collect that we take um, so once we decompress that data we apply some power corrections and uh, uh, yeah, so then let's see direct path um, let's go to this slide because it explains a little better okay so so once we've done that, we we have a, what's called a I see I see a Wayne laughing there. This is a it's called a radar waterfall plot, right? It's kind of similar to what um, I think I think maybe his name was Jim was showing earlier. Uh, so you can think of uh, the y-axis here as the um, uh, the nor your normal time axis, right? So you can think of the spacecraft. It started taking data up here in the upper left, and as you go down in time uh, towards the end of the collect, that's kind of where it stopped. Okay, and then the, the x-axis is essentially the, um, the packetized samples uh, for each pulse. So, so each um, row, the y dimension here, uh, go, or, yeah, going across here, is uh, a single pulse that the, that the radar received. And the, the thing that always kind of blows me away is you, you start with this uh, seemingly all noise data set, right? And then you do um, what's called a, a convolution, right? So you take a model 
uh, of your linear frequency modulated signal. Uh, so you think you know what the phase is, or um, you know you know how it's linear, linearly frequency modulated, and so you you take a model of that and you can evolve it with the data, and then you get an output signal that amplifies your signal to noise ratio, uh, and then you start to get imagery that kind of looks like this, right? And um, so you do this on a on a pulse per pulse basis. So you're doing this for every every row in this data set, and it pops out. Um, these three signals that we talked about earlier. So we see the direct path, which is the signal uh, that is received directly at the spacecraft. Uh, the forward scatter, which is the part that we don't want, it's the um, specular reflection point. Uh, it's a very usually very sharp, and it, it kind of throws it, throws us off sometimes. Uh, and then the back scatter, uh, which you can actually start to see some craters here uh, starting to form. And this is also called uh, range compression sometimes. So. Uh, because you're, you're essentially uh, improving your range resolution by doing this. Uh, so the next thing, we basically have a bunch of uh, uh, information about where the spacecraft is, what the timings are, you know, when the, um, you know, when the, when the spacecraft was, was transmitting, right? So, so remember that this is bi-static, and so we use that direct path, direct path signal that we actually just got uh, and we measure the phases from that, and then we treat the radar as if it were a monostatic radar, right? So um, it's really the only way we can do it because since we can't transmit from the radar itself anymore. And um, you know, once we once we have the, uh, the phase as a function of time, we just treat, like I said, the, the spacecraft as if it were monostatically transmitting. Uh, we apply some weights and gains, and then we use a uh, an algorithm called time domain back projection which is, it's actually one of the least used in the radar community from what I understand. Um, but because we're producing science data with it, it is, uh, from what I'm told, it's more, it's more accurate than some of the other, uh, some of the other uh, processes. Uh, so it, the, the downside is that it takes a very long time to um, do the azimuth compression. So this is time domain back projection. It's called, it's a, similar to an azimuth compression technique. It helps you get that, that azimuth uh, resolution that you want to form the imagery. And um, it's uh, we're talking about like you know uh, for a grid half a half a terabyte of um, uh, of data just for the grid per collect so you know like for example three hundred thousand pixels by thirty thousand pixels for for every single uh, radar collect that we take so it's very very data intensive so we wrote this algorithm on um, GPU we have to do this for both channels H and B so receiving uh, horizontal and vertical. And, uh, and run that, run that through the processor. But uh, yeah, so I'm on slide 13. Okay. So this is kind of a high-level view of, of how the time domain back projection works. So, so if you imagine that um, the beam pattern here is sliding across this grid, uh, this grid is essentially like you know how it's a vectorized grid of of uh, the height essentially for those pixels that are given lat long. Um, and so for every step, for each pixel in that beam pattern, you're essentially summing the pulses represented here by a wave. Uh, so if you guys remember Euler's formula, uh, Arjun, you know that one? <clears throat> okay. Feel free to, feel free to ignore that. Um, so you know, Euler's formula represents the, the sinusoidal wave nature, right? So it's a um, e to the i theta is equivalent to cosine theta plus i sine theta, right? And, uh, you know, so then we have um, uh, theta here represents the, um, the phase, right? Uh, at, that, at that given instant. Uh, and then we apply the appropriate antenna pattern weights and the pulse compressed data from those waterfall plots earlier. Uh, and we normalize it by a gain, which is a function of the solid angle subtended by that particular pixel. Uh, and then when you do that, what you end up is with the power received at every pixel location over that collect for the given channel. Okay. And so that's kind of a high level overview of how the image, image processing works. And so you get a lot of science products from there. All right. So the main ones we produce so now we're going to start getting into some cool images and some of the science stuff, right? Um, so uh, we, we decompose this um, 
pole uh, hybrid you know, dual pole radar into four what are called Stokes products, right? And you can think of these Stokes products as the um, the principal axes of uh, of a three dimensional polarization waveform, electromagnetic polarization waveform that, that's been received. And um, so that you know, this is kind of the first time we're seeing an image coming from this guy, right? So the S one is the full power, and honestly, you don't really have to worry about these too much, but uh, CPR is actually one of the primary science products we look like. So that's the circular polarization ratio. Uh, the important thing here is that it is a function of just these, these Stokes parameters. So uh, we'll talk some more about that in a minute. But uh, so on this grid, we also have like produce like a ton of data, right? So we've got what are called backplanes. We've got all the geometry at every pixel location, uh, you know, what the timing was across, you know, across the whole grid, like when did it start, when did it stop? Um, a, lot of, a lot of good stuff here. Uh, okay, so interesting science products that come from these Stokes products that we've just produced. So the primary one that, that we've historically looked at is circular polarization ratio. Uh, there's some kind of neat work that I've done recently with polarization decompositions. Uh, and then there's some stuff that I'm going to show you guys that I'm not quite done yet with, but I think it's really cool. So, so we'll talk about it anyway. So it's basically estimating permittivity on the lunar surface, which is a, a material property that, that can help us um, understand what types of materials are on the lunar surface. And, and Nick, and I have a quick question. Hey. So a uh, comment first is, yeah. you know, what's really interesting here is just how much it takes to get an image. I think uh, many of yeah. us take it for granted uh, that this isn't like what we're doing from our optical uh, data collection and processing. Um, and uh, so, you know, you know, with all the compression and all the algorithms and all the math and science that goes into this, uh, could you just in a nutshell summarize to this point, you know, what you're able to do today um, that we weren't able to do before this capability? Because there's been pictures coming back from the moon for a long time, right? Through, from different um, devices and, L, and uh, LRO has been up there for a little while now. But uh, this is a unique capability, right? Right. Um, so I'm I'm actually not aware of any other uh, radars much uh, earlier in the timeline at the moon, mm -hmm. other than so there was a precursor to this, but it launched around the same time. It's called, uh, if I'm pronouncing it correctly, uh, Chandrayaan, which was an Indian uh, ice uh, Indian mission. So it, they have a, a sister radar to this one. Um, I don't think it's uh, in operation anymore. Um, but it uh, was very similar in capability, and we're possibly going to be actually asked, like as a as a post processing thing, to actually start looking at some of their data and cross correlating it with ours. Um, so in terms of uh, capability, I can I, I don't really have another reference point, right? So I'm kind of new to radar, but uh, I can tell you that with this radar, we are able to like get down to um, about five uh, uh, about half a meter approximately an azimuth um, and uh, sub-meter in range, actually. And so the problem is when we do that, our grid sizes and our images are, are so incredibly large that you know, it's, it becomes uh, so computationally intensive that it, you know, some, of our, some of our supercomputers can't handle it. So right now, we're processing uh, onto 4 meter by 20 meter pixels. And uh, once we do that, we actually create our imagery and uh, down sample that to 100 meter by 100 meter uh, pixel images. And so all the imagery that you're, that you're about to see, they're all 100 meter by 100 meter resolution pixels. But um, the reason we, we can actually go down further is because you get uh, a noise source called speckle in the imagery. And the, and the, and the more you, um, the more data you have essentially to average down, the, the less uh, speckle you have in your, in your final image. So the noise kind of goes down. So it's better to, process that way but thank you yeah yeah of course how does that compare to the resolution that they're using the optical imaging technique they're on the lro uh i think i think lro is a little bit better i think they're uh uh sub meter and 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 doing that pretty regularly they might they might be like meter level kind of uh kind of resolution I'm not, I'm not exactly sure because um, it's going to be several months before I, I actually start taking their data and, and cross correlating with mine. And that's, that's when I'm going to have to start learning about, about their optical system. And so, 
Uh, unfortunately, I don't I don't know too much about it right now. So, uh, but they're all online. I mean, you can you can you know look it up, uh, or I can look it up later, or we can talk about it afterwards. Uh, we'll talk about it then. So I have a question, Nick. Um, so in terms of knowing where to search for say water, I know that there was a discovery of water molecules on the moon surface by Sophia back in October of 2020. Has that affected where you might go looking for water on the moon? And, and are you only looking on the surface or are you also looking under the surface. I think you said something about right. going yeah, below we, the surface. Yes, yeah, as, as far as uh, Sophia, we're we're not uh, currently looking at their data. Uh, I'm kind of inundated with 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 data myself with the mini RF side of it alone right now. Um, but but it is kind of it's interesting. You bring up another mission that that has confirmed water ice because uh, if you guys remember the uh, the El Cross mission um, that that crashed into the south pole of the moon uh, i forget how many years ago it was now actually lro launched with lcross at the same time they were they were both fit in the in the fairing uh both launched in 2009 on this on the same vehicle um and so you know we've been pretty fortunate that uh, uh lro is actually actually still functioning um and we didn't crash it uh, on accident into the, into the moon right so um yeah pri primarily right now we're looking at the poles uh, and so there's a lot of evidence that suggests that uh, the south, there's a region in the South Pole that does have, uh, that's in permanent shadow, that does have surface water ice. And so that's, that's distinct uh, from subsurface water ice because it essentially would prevent astronauts from, from having to drill, right? Um, so with MINIRF though, we can, we can look slightly into the subsurface. The, the results get a little muddied and you have to uh, have some, have some, uh, sophisticated models in order to kind of, you know, back out the, uh, the power that you're receiving and how far you're down you're going and uh, it gets a little complicated, but we actually are working on that. I'm not too involved with it yet, uh, but I'm, I'm working on a paper with a, a grad student at, uh, at Hopkins and we're, we're getting there slowly. So. Okay, so now the, now the cool images, right? Um, so this is the circular polarization ratio. And this is, like I said, historically, how um, scientists have, have been uh, looking with the mini RF data for, for water ice. So uh, experiments in the lab have shown that uh, uh, CPR of approximately one corresponds to water ice. And what CPR actually is, it's a, it's a ratio, right? Using those Stokes products, but physically what it is, it's a measure of how much of the return signal uh, is in the same polarization state uh, that was transmitted to the uh, to the polarization that is in the in in the opposite uh, opposite polarization state. And so a ratio around one uh, apparently corresponds to water. Uh, so so these are some of the processed images with a, uh, a color bar stretch essentially, uh, blue being you know close to zero, one being red. So if it's red. Uh, there's a there's some likelihood that uh, there's potentially water ice there. So I put this one here. This is an, an X band collect. Uh, this is a polar collect that we actually took last week. Um, and so I made kind of a joke. There's this red X that popped up here, and I was like, okay, I know exactly where to land. Let's tell the tell the Artemis mission. I think there's buried treasure there. Right? Um, so nobody really thought that was funny except for me, and. Uh, this is this is actually a byproduct from uh, some direct path uh, contamination in the imagery that we that we were unable to cross out. But, uh, so so these figures are all biostatic here. Uh, to me, they're like they're gorgeous, man. I mean, you, you know, you zoom in on these things. There's ton, tons of resolution. They're very very pretty. Lots of color, um, you know. But there actually is valid science data here for for the majority of these. Uh, and so this is a, a global mosaic, just taken within the first year of the monostatic uh, data set. And so it was kind of continually running, you know, it's in a polar orbit. So you see these long, uh, these long strips here going, you know, north to south, south to north. Uh, for um, so we just kind of map that back to the lunar surface and to show the global CPR here. All right. Uh, so a quick overview of the next thing that I, I recently worked on. This is a polarization decomposition. 
um, it, essentially, this is this is kind of how it works, right? You represent your electromagnetic wave uh, in time and space. You kind of remove some of those components, and you get a you can get a two dimensional representation of the polarization at a given at a given instant, right? Um, so then, if you if you take that uh, and abstract that into three dimensional space, the Stokes products become the principal components for uh, for that for that polarization uh, representation for that for that received signal. So S1, is, as we mentioned, is the full power. So that's like, that is the, the standard image that you're looking at when you, when you produce a, a radar image. Uh, M is the degree of polarization. So once you start down sampling, you're actually going to lose some, uh, some, of your, some of your full power in your signal. Uh, and so we call this particular polarization decomposition M chi because you're representing how much polarization is there and the ellipticity in, uh, in the received signal. And what that actually does for you uh, when you create some 3D models and, and kind of like, quote unquote, bounce them off these different representations, you can uh, uh, come up with uh, three different types of scattering, scattering physics, right? So you can have uh, even bounce. So does it bounce off a particular object twice, four times, you know, uh, randomly polarized, meaning you can't discern what it is, it's just random. Uh, and then you have an odd bounce, so, or single bounce, right? Which is uh, also called Bragg scattering, and this is kind of a radar design parameter. Actually, you want Bragg scattering because that's how you're one of the one of the ways your radar performs the best. And so we take these different modes of scattering physics and we associate them with a color. And when you do that, uh, you actually uh, I think I'm going to skip this, but you guys are you guys are familiar with uh, histograms and stuff. This was this was just talking about a, a stretch that I did to improve the scattering physics representation but um, so now you've got these these images that are red green blue images uh, you know three three banded images and they represent the scattering physics coming off the lunar surface and uh, the interesting thing so as I said before blue is Bragg so single bounce you would expect uh, uh, smooth flat surfaces to uh, be mostly blue um, things that are double bounce uh, or complex, you would you would expect them to be uh, uh, red, and then random is green. So if you combine red and green, you get yellow, and you can actually like uh, see the ejecta that came out of uh, Kepler crater here, and and you know very very great detail. I was super happy with this; it turned out so good. And um, but you know, and so that is representative of the scattering physics, right? When these craters come in, there's a lot of heat that's created. They throw out a lot of material. Uh, they're going to be a different um, uh, uh, composition than the, the pre what was previously there, right? So the material properties have changed at that point. And we're actually kind of looking at that, uh, kind of looking at the remnants of that. It was pretty cool. So uh, here's some more examples. This is X-band. Uh, I put this here because they look cool, but honestly, we don't trust our X-band calibration at the moment. Um, we've been going through uh, some different cycles of calibration with the X-band uh, radar or CPR uh, consistently has a gradient in it. And we've had many a radar expert we brought in to try and help us figure this out, and we just haven't been able to yet. So we're still still going down that road. You know, um, it, It's funny to think 11 years later, we're still having like all these issues with the radar. It's how kind of complex, complicated the system is. A lot of very smart people have worked on this for a oh, long hey, time. So Nick, just real quick, uh, in layman's terms, um, how would you know by looking at that, that you have a calibration issue. So the, these actually look good. Uh, so these are some of the best looking X-band flex that we have. Um, so you can kind of see one here. You see how this bottom part here is uh, uh, darker. Yes. And this is, um, this is actually m -chi. So you actually mostly see it in the CPR. So if I pulled up some CPR, um, I can do that after the talk if you want. I've got like, a ton of them over here. But, uh, it, it consistently is washed out. You actually don't see any details in the CPR images for a lot of the X-band clicks. Whereas in, in the S-band, you actually do. Uh, so if I go back to uh, these three here are S-band, they look really great. This is a polar click, which is kind of anomalous, right? So we're doing by statics. We don't get the uh, too many opportunities to, to do polar clicks by statically. Uh, so this one's kind of an anomaly. It actually turned out okay, but you see how this is nowhere near you know, as nice looking or as detailed uh, as the rest of these. And also the scale here, it's orange, right? So that tells us that 
CPR is about five, whereas with some of this, we would expect it to be you know, much closer to zero. Um, and so that is, that is probably, probably the best example I have in here uh, in the slide deck of why, why our calibrations kind of kind of jacked up. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, all right, so the next thing, this is kind of what I'm actively working on now. This, is, this has been, been a lot of work uh, over the past couple months, and I haven't, I haven't actually got too far, but um, it is very cool in my opinion. So, uh, so quick, quickly, you know, for, for people that aren't uh, too familiar with, you know, material properties, I'm not really either. So, you know, obviously have to read about this stuff. Um, and so what is permittivity, right? Uh, permittivity is essentially a, uh, a material's ability to um, be polarized by an electromagnetic field, right? So it's it's not susceptibility, that's actually another, another parameter, but it's, um, so high permittivity means that it is, um, it has the ability to be, the atoms in that material have the ability to be redirected easily, essentially, right? Um, uh, realigned with the electro electromagnetic field easily. Uh, so, so there's two components to it, right? It's a complex uh, number. There's a real component and an imaginary component. The imaginary component of that is the uh, that material's uh, uh, efficiency in converting that EM energy that it's uh, been impinged on it to heat. So it's also called the dielectric loss. Uh, the figure here uh, shows water. These different color horizontal bands up here. This is uh, water permittivity at different temperatures. Uh, so the blue and yellow uh, here represent the S and X band in the F. So it kind of shows you where the overlap is and um, permittivity values that we're looking for per band. Uh, so, you know, we're obviously going to be looking at something below zero. Uh, so if you follow the blue curve down, that's the real component, real component of the uh, uh, permittivity. The dotted line is the imaginary component. So we're kind of in a good, a good spot to measure the uh, water permittivity, uh, given these two wave bands that we have. Um, and so now that kind of begs the question, how do we get permittivity estimates from radar data, right? Like all we've got at this point is like power, we know the geometry, that kind of stuff. Okay. Um, so this looks pretty nasty. It's actually it's actually not that bad. Uh, this is this is a it's called the the, the integrated equation model. It is a radar uh, radar prediction equation for monostatic radar. And uh, bottom line here is that it predicts the backscatter. So it predicts the received signal per channel, so H or V, uh, and it's a function of the incidence angle, uh, it's a function of the uh, permittivity, and it's a function of the surface roughness uh, in the wave band, right? Uh, so that's kind of, it's, com it's a complex equation, and you can't uh, easily invert it. And so uh, here, here are some examples. So I implemented this, uh, this quote unquote forward model that represents the backscatter, and uh, Y axis is the uh, the power power received per channel based on color um, for a few different uh, types of input parameters, right? So the top three are based on geometry. So your incidence angle, the next two down here, uh, vary uh, surface roughness height to give you kind of an idea of how those change uh, change the received signal. And then the last one here is permittivity. So it looks like permittivity has a pretty big influence uh, on the backscatter. Okay, and so. All right, we've got a forward model that can help prevent, uh, predict what, what the signal return might be. Um, so how do we use MiniRef's data in order to get an estimate with that from uh, permittivity, right? So primary inputs, again, permittivity, incidence angle, surface roughness, and it outputs uh, backscatter coefficient. So the MiniRef data we have available uh, is backscatter uh, uh, at full power, which we can get it, you know, with some data manipulation, we can get it into a uh, surface coefficient, right, which is essentially just a, a measure of uh, reflectance at the, at the surface, uh, kind of, it's kind of radar in specific to an extent. Uh, so we have the geometry as well, so kind of have the surface roughness, talk a little bit about that. It's not good enough quality from the lower data, so I had to do some uh, finagling to, to get this to where we want. Uh, but then permittivity, right, we need permittivity, we want to estimate this, and it's not easily solved uh, from, from the equations that I just showed you guys. So uh, there's, there's a, a series of uh, a, whole, a whole group, and people dedicate PhDs to, to this one topic called model inversion. 
Uh, so it's a very popular topic in remote sensing. And it's essentially what it is, is you have some kind of uh, mo predictive model for what you're trying to do. And the data that you actually have represents the outputs from, from that model. And so you don't actually have all the data that you need. And so you essentially have to kind of minimize the errors and solve for uh, whatever parameter it is you're, you're trying to solve for. That's, so that's what they call model inversion. Uh, so that's what we're using here to kind of estimate permittivity. Um, so I should be wrapping up here pretty, pretty soon. Uh, how am I doing on time, Phil? At about uh, 12, 15 more minutes. Okay. Um, so this is this is the bi-static uh, uh, backscatter coefficient equation. Um, basically, this, uh, this dig these digital numbers are the uh, kind of the S you know byproduct of the S one and S two Stokes products. So they're the the power received in the horizontal channel and the vertical channel. So we break that out. Uh, this is the radar range equation. This might look familiar to some guys that have studied you know radar and signal stuff. Uh, and then there's this extra geometric component that accounts for the bi-static nature of that, that, this weird situation that we're in, right? Um, and, um, okay, so, so now we have a model for essentially taking the mini raft data and putting it into a form that our forward model can use. And then, so uh, surface roughness, there actually is no data that exists uh, that's good enough for what we need uh, for surface roughness. So. Um, the good the good news is that within the forward model parameters, the uh, backscatter doesn't change that much. And so uh, I originally pulled the Lola surface data and uh, uh, found out that it, it wasn't uh, down to the resolution we need. So we, we need surface roughness resolutions on the order of the wavelengths of the radar itself. So we're talking, you know, a few centimeters to at most like 12, 12 13 centimeters, something like that, and it doesn't exist. Um, so what I did is I took a USGS map of the lunar surface, and in there, there's a bunch of descriptions actually on the topology. And so I took the LOLA data and then created a scaling factor based on those descriptions and took all the polygons and then mapped it back to the lunar surface to get a, uh, a rough, rough estimate of what that uh, uh, actual uh, surface roughness would be at that, at that scale. And so that's kind of another data set that we're using. Uh, so that was a question that I was holding off on until the end, but um, yeah. I was going to ask you, you know, with, with the, you know, with the heavy formulas and everything else, did you start out with a theoretical prediction um, sample set, if you will, so you've got something to compare to with what's actually observed to, I, to yep. see if you're on target or not? So, so something uh, similar to this has been done with the monostatic data. Uh, to my knowledge, no one's done this with the bi-static data yet. Um, so I read, I read a couple of papers. There are people who are producing permittivity estimates of the lunar surface, but they're doing it in a different way than I'm doing it. Uh, so I did, I did steal a few people's ideas, uh, but ran into a lot of roadblocks with their approach. And so I kind of had to come up with, uh, with my own technique uh, to do this. So. Um, this this forward model actually has been used uh, before by another guy to produce the um, the the monostatic permittivity. I'm not exactly sure what he was kind of doing down the road. I kind of had to to do the rest of this back end part myself and figure it out. But it actually looks pretty good. So I'll show you that on the on the next slide. Um, so okay, so we got a, a parameterized list of backscatter coefficients from the forward model. Uh, different values for the incidence angle that we can parameterize, permittivity, uh, and surface roughness. And um, we basically uh, now have you know, three of these data sets, so these two, first two and the last one. And so all we need now is permittivity. So how do we do that? So there's an algorithm called uh, a KNN search. And essentially what that is, it's just a uh, linear regression model on a, for a multi-dimensional data set. Uh, that does uh, uh, a nearest neighbor search. So, so if I if I have a you know n by four dimensional data set, I can uh, throw in uh, and at each pixel I can throw in what I want um, these these parameters for that pixel, and then what the KNN uh, search will do will give me back the n or the k excuse me the k closest 
uh, estimates uh, for what would match what I'm querying, right? And so when I do that, I can essentially just take an average, uh, average that down to get an approximation for the permittivity. When I do that on a per pixel basis, this is kind of what I'm seeing now that I'm getting. Um, so this one, this top one here is my favorite. This is also the Kepler, Kepler crater. And I should probably, it's so dark, I should probably uh, uh, zoom in a little bit so you can see kind of all the details here. Um, but, uh-oh, didn't like that. Okay, am I still? Uh... Yep, you're good. Okay, uh, okay, so, so again, we're seeing that uh, crater ejector, right? It looks a little different than the MCI decomposition, but you can actually come over here and see like a kind of some minor discrepancies if it's showing up in Zoom. So uh, black here is um, just slightly above permittivity of free space. And uh, red here is uh, something above, I think three, uh, a ratio of three permittivity. And uh, there's still some artifacts in here, like this red uh, is really just a byproduct of the, um, uh, the strong signal return because there's a, a radar facing lip there. And so it's still working through that. But I mean, this, these pictures are pretty, pretty gorgeous. You know, uh, you see the purples and the black and uh, I, I'm starting to believe that this is kind of scientifically uh, valid to an extent, but we're going to use um, some machine learning algorithms after this on a bigger, bigger data set to kind of create like a full, uh, full prediction of the permittivity map of the, the whole lunar surface once we get all this done. Um, but, uh, let's see. So this, these ejecta here, you would expect these to be higher permittivity than the surrounding area. Again, like you, like we saw with MCI. Um, see. So some of these didn't turn out so good, and I have to figure out why why that is. So it's still still a work in progress. Um, but we have we have a about 130 different collects we've taken by statically, and so I'm working with a very large very large data set. Uh, so so a lot more to come. And so last thing I kind of wanted to mention, if anyone's you know I don't know how familiar you guys are with this, but uh, NASA's PDS data node. Uh, so you can essentially go here and get any any type of data that you want from any spacecraft mission, right? So if you're interested in camera data, you can go get like raw raw camera data from any mission, right? You can go get get, get data from Juno or uh, uh, New Horizons or any of this stuff, right? Uh, freely download it, play with the data. You know, if you have the the computational capacity or the system that can handle a lot of stuff, some of it's rather large. Uh, but you can pull the mini RF data uh, from here as well. And so, you know, usually once we, we do another round of processing, um, we upload all this to, to the PDS node and we label it so you can you know, actually take that data down and read it. And, um, but uh, yeah, a lot, of, a lot of cool stuff on there. So I highly encourage anyone that's interested in, in playing with uh, space data, go here and uh, check it out if you have some free time. No, that was kind of a mouthful. And, uh, I apologize because, like I me, mean, like I said, radar stuff it's incredibly complex, and there's so many moving parts. And I, to be to be fair, I don't I don't understand it all personally. Like I can I can decompose each little little piece and understand that, but the big picture, you know, putting it all together is still still kind of hard for me. And I've been doing this for you know year and a half now, so uh, uh, pretty difficult stuff. And uh, thank thank you everyone for listening and and not falling asleep on me. So. Uh, yeah. No, thank, thanks, Nick. You know, yeah. nothing to apologize for here. Um, uh, if you were giving us a test on some of those uh, slides with all the formulas, then you'd um, be happy you were on Zoom and not in person uh, <laughs> because you'd probably, you know, you wouldn't have to change your flat tires. But, uh, the, uh, but what's really the takeaway here is it's very interesting. You know, we've been on the moon. We've been studying the moon for a very, very long time with you know, the sophisticated instruments, sophisticated instruments that were available during the time and today, and it's still a work in progress. Yep. And it's not as simple as you need know, to take the data coming back and have trust in what the data translates into is what you're showing, that there's a lot of work to figure yep. that out. You would think it would just be a no brainer at this point, but obviously that's just not the case. Yeah, yeah you really, you really have to have a uh... Uh, cross correlation between multiple data sets in order for most scientists to agree on it, right? Um, so, so even though you know we've had multiple instances of like, yes, we have water ice, you know, this date and time, these two, three instruments have seen it, and there's good, 
uh, good estimate. There's still a lot of scientists in the community that um, they're not convinced yet uh, for whatever reason. And so, so Nick, what we would probably all really appreciate um, moving forward now is when you get a um, a clear picture, uh, no pun intended, of something that's new and exciting that came from your data analyzation. Uh, if you would communicate that, you know, it's right through the the Google group there, of course, or even yeah. during one of these meetings, and just to show here's what you found. You know, it's, you don't have to go into all the math how you got there, but here was the result of the work. And okay. I think everybody after this presentation will be really interested to see what it produces. Cool. Yeah, yeah, we'll do. Thank That's you. So, any, anybody so, have any questions for uh, or comments? Yeah, I, I got a couple of questions. I guess you just said you that the crater ejecta would you expect to have a different permittivity than the non-ejecta surface. And I'm curious, since permittivity is a uh, material property, why do you think the ejecta is a different material? It's, uh, I think it's because it was uh, superheated at one point, right? There's, there's Okay, big... so the crater formation changed it, changed yep. its properties. Yep, yeah, okay. the, uh, yeah, the, the uh, um, uh, essentially like the magnetation, magnetization of an atom can change once it gets to a high temperature and can actually stay and freeze that way, right? Uh, okay. I think, I think, I think a good example of that is uh, in iron, right? Like you heat iron up, kind of, kind of changes, and you can like have it be its its dipoles essentially form in uh, in one direction, and you cool it again, they'll uh, stay that way until it's um, hit with another EM field. I think, right? So okay. Been, and the second, yeah. thank you. The second question, I guess. This is obviously extremely complex. So I'm assuming the software you're using is also extremely complex. How do you yes. test it and make sure that you know that you can trust the results you're getting? All right. So, so uh, all basically all of our software has, has been uh, developed in house. Um, I've, I've written some pieces of it, but uh, one of the guys I mentioned uh, early on, uh, Scott Turner, his, his name is on the front slide. He, he's been, uh, Basically doing this since like 2009, uh, since the since the early uh, mission, and um, so how do we test? Let's you know we we actually we do we do test the software, but um, you know so I hate I hate to admit this, but you know sometimes you have uh, gurus in a field, and uh, a lot of times they you know they kind of get looked at like they can do no wrong, and uh, uh, this is this is kind of one of those situations where we do have. A testing schedule lined up, right? So we have so many, so much data, about a, you know 130 collects or so. When something looks weird, you you automatically kind of can tell that in the data. Um, but you know, really, there's just kind of too much to test all of it. And it, and it's you know it's science software, so it's kind of harder to find, right? That's a good, that's a really good question because I don't know, I don't really know how to how to test like such a niche uh, software suite when you're trying to pull pull science data out of it. So. Okay, thanks. Okay, so thanks, Nick, very much. Uh, hang on, you know, if you can, uh, you know, at the end of the meeting, some people may still have some more things that they might want to ask you. Um, really appreciate it, excellent job. Hey, and, thanks. Uh, get the big Zoom wave there. So thank you very, very much. Um, let me share my screen again. So next month, I want to point out, um, and I'll send out email reminders that next month, the meeting is gonna be the fourth Thursday of the month, not the third Thursday where it normally is. And that's out of respect for the Jewish holiday of Yom Kippur, which uh, takes place on the third Thursday. So we're gonna to move to the fourth Thursday and um, our, our guest presenter is gonna be Dr. Dan, and I'll leave it to you guys to pronounce his last name because I don't massacre it. But uh, he's gonna talk about observing the next galactic supernova. Uh, he's going to be joining us from Purdue University. So it'll be another uh, uh, wonderful speaker. He's excited uh, to, to join us. So look forward to seeing everybody there for the next meeting. Um, also, oh, hang on a second. I'm on the wrong screen here. And there we go. Um, so also coming up, uh, September 4th is our members only um, star party at Alpha Ridge. And um, hopefully... <laughs> We'll have some clear skies. It'll be the first one for our events. So uh, keep your fingers crossed for that. And then on September 11th will be our next public star party at Alpha Ridge. So once again, 
uh, we're hoping, you know, to have some some clear skies and, and be able to, to do some observing and not so much just simply socializing. So, and all this information is um, on the um, on the health site. And um, of course, uh, myself or other members of the leadership team will be sending out emails regularly, keeping everybody posted. So what's coming up in September for uh, astronomical events? I uh, grabbed this from, uh, you can see the source up there. A uh, nice simple uh, place to, to, to get what's what's coming up and the new moon is the uh, the seventh. Uh, and then the 14th, we have Neptune in opposition. So, um, so uh, for those of you who are gonna try and seek out uh, Neptune, uh, I don't know what time it actually is best to see it at. I haven't done that level of research. I don't know if uh, any of you already have that at your fingertips, uh, Gene or anybody like that, but. Uh, and then on, uh, uh, you can see the Mercury, Mercury's as greatest Eastern elongation on the 14th. Uh, the full moon uh, for you lunar observers, uh, you can do things when the moon is full by using proper filters. And I've done some of this, you know, this picture here, the moon was almost completely full at that point. And uh, you, you can certainly do things uh, when you're not uh, searching for fake fuzzy galaxies and other objects. So, and then on the 22nd is the September equinox. So that's what's highlighted um, for, um, and I have the borders named on there because I copy and pasted. But, uh, all right, so moving into the, uh, the uh, photos and the art. So, Brad, are you on? Oh uh, yeah, I guess you guys can hear me. Brad, I have um, to tell you, you know, I like everybody's pictures, but I'm a, you know, as everybody has called those who've been around for a while, I'm a huge fan of globular clusters. and. This one's pretty spectacular in the amount of detail that you were able to pull out in the various colors. Yeah, thanks. I've uh, I always wanted to shoot a, a close up of globular of a glob basically. So this is M13 in Hercules. I bought, I guess, in the beginning of the year, an eight inch uh, Ritchie Cretan or Cretan telescope, um, and it's pretty bright, so only about three hours exposure. And uh, yeah, I was pretty happy with the way it came out. And then Brian, are you on? Did I hear Brian? Oh, I think Brian couldn't make it, but here's his Eastern Bell Nebula. And um, uh, pretty cool shot. It's uh, 20 uh, 10 minute images that are stacked. That's why I made that note there. Wayne, I know you're here. Yeah, this is a quick image of the Crescent Nebula. It's only a little over uh, three hours long in LRGB uh, from the uh, last impromptu at Alpha Ridge Park. So it's all the data I could get before the clouds came in. So uh, this, this nebula is right in the center of Cygnus, and it's a uh, it's a emission nebula caused by the uh, fast stellar wind from a Wolf Ray A star somewhere in the center. I'm not sure if it's that really bright star near the center or if it's another star. Uh, the nebula is about uh, 5,000 light years from Earth. So, so it's kind of far away. Yeah. But you know, there's one thing, you know, for, for those of you who are new, you know, um, that have been, you know, joined us recently for some of our social public events, because we couldn't, because of the clouds, couldn't do anything more. But, and then from the time that, you know, sometimes I get to talk to a lot of you when I was at, you know, at Company 7, when you stopped in and you're looking at what kind of telescope to get, but you're going to see that there's an awful lot of images that were taken with eight inch telescopes, six inch telescopes, uh, camera lenses, and things like that. You don't have to necessarily have a 12 or 13 inch mirror telescope or a large refractor. And, and these are done in light polluted skies with various filters, right, Wayne? And, um, yes. and uh, you, could, you could do an awful lot of very good astrophotography with reasonably sized amateur scopes. Yeah. So. You can do a good job of it with just a camera and, yeah. a t and telephoto lens or even wide angle lenses for different kinds of uh, views of the same area of sky. Right. And you know we'll have those images a lot of times, uh, you know, during these meetings. And uh, here's our rookies, uh, uh, Chris and Jared. You know, you you guys will get it right one day. <laughs> Working on it. 
it's been a yeah. tough month. it's been a tough month and hopefully we get some clear skies um yeah, yeah just uh cygnus wall um north american nebula that was uh that was shot with the 130 millimeter um aperture and then the veil nebula on the left in the same uh same scope and then I think we have two more pictures. I'll go quick so I don't take up yeah. too much time. It's all right. We're doing good on time today. Okay. Okay. So, and very nice. There you go. And the picture on the left there again is the North American Nebula. To your point earlier, that was taken with a DSLR and a 135 millimeter prime lens. Nothing really in the astro world. It's just a typical DSLR. I did have it on a star tracker, and that was um, about 45 minutes of 45 second shots and uh, just love the star field and you know that wide angle is uh, something that is a lot of fun sometimes and very different than what you see in a, a larger focal length yeah very nice and what software once again are you using for your uh, processing and stacking and everything we use uh, PixInsight uh, Deep Sky Stacker to stack and uh, Photoshop to clean it up in the end and just put the final touches on it so a couple different applications mm -hmm. Where did you guys take that picture? Both of those pictures were taken from my backyard in Ellicott City. Portal 7, I believe. <laughs> so, not too bad. Uh, not too bad. Uh, Considering the smoke, too, I think that was the other thing that was kind of amazing is there's been a lot of uh, turp or uh, the transparency hasn't been that great. So, hopefully, that'll turn around in the next couple months and get better pictures. Yeah. Cool. Michael, Jan. Uh, hi. Hi. There you go. Another globular cluster. Yeah, this was the M3, and uh, I'm I'm very new to astrophotography, so this was one of the clusters I was actually able to get, and it didn't just look really really fuzzy. Uh, I have a uh, six inch uh, C6N Celestron, and I've got a um, a ZWO camera on it. So I think this was about uh, seven minutes of exposure. Got it. Are you using the color camera or the monochrome ZWO? It, it's the uh, color, uh, 462. Great, great. Very nice. Thank you. And there's your uh, M51. And this was uh, on July 4th. I uh, turned from finally looking at globulars and said, oh, let me try to get a galaxy. And this is the Whirlpool. and. This was about 20 minutes of, of time on that. And uh, I'm just in my front yard, uh, right out, right off my uh, driveway. So it was, I was pretty excited on July 4th with the fireworks going off to get this. There you go. Very cool, very nice. So Victor's not the only one that does front yard astronomy. Yeah, I just roll it right out on my uh, scope roller that uh, Steve Rifkin recommended the wheels. And um, I can't lift my scope anymore since I got injured in the spring. So it's been awesome. Just roll it right out. Very nice, thank you. Gene. You're on, there you go. Right, this is the Trifid Nebula, Trifid, however you say it. And I think this is from like a year ago. Oh, did I delete the wrong one? No. <laughs> I, I, there's one that you said you, you had already shown. And I, yeah, that was M27. Oh, okay, I made exactly the wrong one. You got the right one. Okay. Um, Okay, like say so. This is mostly narrow band. This one and the next one are, are both narrow band. I'm I'm still working on yeah on how you can combine it with the uh, RGB, which is mainly just for the stars. It's amazing the RGB version of this is just like the center quarter of it. The narrow band really brings out, especially the red, the hydrogen alpha. And this is just from my backyard. I think this one's from two years ago. All right. Very cool. We have a sketch. Bob, are you on? Bob's not on, but Bob did the sketch of uh, Mars and uh, very nicely done. Got all the detail on there. And uh, uh, this was uh, from October 9th of 2020. And Jim, are you, you're on, Jim. I know you're here. Yeah, just some uh, pictures of Jupiter from a couple of weeks ago before the clouds set in uh, using my 10 inch scope also from my front yard. Um, so a couple of features, especially those barges this year are really kind of interesting that are uh, easily visible for, for the moment. 
So when you capture the image, are you capturing it using motion video? Um, right. Yeah, video camera, and uh, then you know, like two minutes, three minutes max, and then uh, taking the best frames. The, the lucky imaging technique. <laughs> And with, and with a 4x parallel. And, 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 and are you using a, a color camera or a monochrome with filters? No, it's a color camera. Uh -huh, thank you. Excellent. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. It's amazing when they come out nice clear like that, you know, when they're so wobbly during the, uh, you look you know, especially when you've got them cranked up with a parallel like that. Yeah, you look back at the video and it's like, how are you ever going to get anything out of it? And then it's just, it's it's like black magic, I swear. You know, by the time you stack it and then you put the wavelets and registax and everything, it's just amazing. Yeah, that's amazing, it's right. Very nice. I like the annotation too. And this was Saturn about a day after opposition, uh, trying to catch the uh, Seeliger effect where the rings are actually kind of a little brighter right at opposition, not. Not sure if I got it or not. If I get another image in a few weeks, I'll see if there's any difference. Yeah. So, um, you know, I can't wait till the, you know, now the planets are coming up and at a reasonable hour uh, for those, you know, who can't make it till two or three o'clock in the morning. But, uh, you know, especially during public events when you could have people looking at Saturn through, um, through, through, through good optics and, you know, really see that detail. You know, Saturn's one of those, Saturn and Jupiter are those objects that people can really see things in person, almost like you can see them on the images. Yeah, I mean, Saturn never fails to excite somebody. It's, right. it's just gorgeous. Right. By the way, I'm sorry to tell everybody that I did receive today my uh, brand new um, AVX, um, Celestron AVX mount, so I can use my 105 millimeter uh, astrophysics traveler. And that will ruin our skies for another 30 days at least. Yep, another 30 guys. days. I apologize, but it looks good in my garage and my view is just as good in my garage as it was at the public star party last week. So there you go. Ian, are you on? Okay. Yes, there yes. You know. This is uh, very nice. Jupiter, July 5th um, with my uh, eight inch uh, uh, Schmidt Cassegrain I got in 1983. And uh, this is the best of 250 frames uh, and, and auto stackered and uh, use Registax and then Windows Photo to uh, further process. Did you do this one at the in West Virginia or did you do it? No, I, this is uh, in my front yard okay. in Owings Mills. Very nice. And that's it. So um, I wanna thank everyone. I'm gonna, I'm gonna stop the recording in a minute. And then uh, if there's anything anybody wants to talk about, I would like some feedback. Um, on, on my proposal for you know how to use uh, the Robinson Nature Center and these monthly meetings. So uh, before we go, I got a couple of corrections. One is uh, I had mentioned that Herman's uh, celebration of life is on Sunday this week. It's actually Saturday, um, and, and I know that because I'm going there. I just threw the wrong day out. Uh, and Joel's got something also he would like to um, tell everybody. Uh, yes, uh, Ken saw um, uh, shared earlier this week in our uh, Google group uh, links to the um, ALCON, the Amer um, Astronomical League convention that's going on virtually right now. Um, actually, the speaker's going on right now until 11 o'clock this evening. And then tomorrow and um, Saturday, I am going to share in the chat. Let's see if I did that. Uh, I'll share in the chat in just a minute as soon as I figure out how to do that. Uh, the links for that. Right, and thank you very much. There's some interesting speakers going on. So I'm gonna formally end the meeting. So thank you very much. I really appreciate everybody joining and for all your input, Nick, excellent job. Thank you very, very much. I'm gonna stop the recording and then we can continue on. So clear skies, everyone, stay safe.